Father God, we do indeed praise you that you are the speaking God, the living God, that you've not left us alone in the dark, um, but that you indeed have spoken to us, that we might know you and love you, and pray that you would move our hearts in that direction today. For Jesus' sake, amen. What's the worst accommodation you have ever stayed in? I bet if we asked around the room, there could be some real horror stories about some particularly grim places that you've stayed. Uh, one of the worst for me as a young adult is I was staying in a youth hostel in inner city Manchester. And uh, it, was a, it was a room shared with, I think, about, I think there were about 12 bunks in the room, some really loud, snoring strangers. I really didn't get a wink of sleep. And, you know, the smell wasn't great either. And then there were the shared showers as well. It was a terrible experience. TripAdvisor didn't exist back then, but if it did, I would have given it a one-star review. Well, what do we make of Jonah's accommodation in this chapter? It's dark, it's cramped, and he's soaking in digestive juices. We get his review of his accommodation, though, in chapter 2. And what Jonah says is, five stars! Five stars! Praise God! Saved from certain death. You could say he's having a whale of a time. Sorry, I know it says fish as well. Anyway, anyway, sorry, sorry. We have some um, vital and very practical lessons from Jonah this morning that we're going to consider under three headings. Firstly, experience grace. What is it that Jonah deserves? Well, if you're new to um, Jonah uh, or weren't here last week, let me um, fill you in. So Jonah was supposed to be a prophet. And a prophet has two jobs. They're to speak for God and to speak to God. They're to speak God's word to the people and they're to pray for the people as well. And based on his behaviour in chapter one, Jonah is probably the worst behaved prophet you could meet. God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, that wicked city, and preach judgment. Jonah flees in exactly the opposite direction. He gets as far away from Nineveh as he possibly can. And in so doing, he puts a whole boatload of people and himself at risk. He's even woken up in the middle of the storm that God sent by the pagan captain of the ship who's telling the prophet of God to pray. And he doesn't. Jonah instead opts for death. Instead of admitting he's wrong, instead of turning back to God. Throw me in the sea. That'll sort things out. I'm to blame. Throw me in the sea. Talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. The pagan sailors, well, they're a bit more concerned for Jonah's life than he is. They do everything that they can to try and you know, get back to land and not have to do it. But in the end, they have no choice. They throw him into the sea and suddenly, miraculously, the storm is gone and the sailors are saved. Jonah is a vivid picture of us when we are turned away from God. When I did it my way is the motto that hangs over our lives. When we prefer, well, frankly, anything to obeying what God says. Jonah deserves death. That might sound a bit harsh, but it is exactly what he's chosen. Throw me overboard rather than turning back to God. And every time we turn from God, in essence, we're, we're doing the same thing. Because when we turn from God who is light and life and love, well, that can only leave us with death and darkness and despair in the end. What is it that changes things for Jonah? Well, it's that he experiences God's grace. He deserves death, but God has plans to give him life. So enter stage right, a great fish. Verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We find out in chapter two from Jonah's big prayer of praise that he did in fact pray. At last he prayed when he was just inches from death. That's when he came to his senses, when he was right near the end. And you might know examples of people who, who've come to faith through similar kind of circumstances. That while there is still breath, there is hope of receiving God's grace. Deathbed conversions are very rare, but we have the, the thief on the cross who turns to Jesus at the last possible moment 
And it shows us that while there's still breath, there is still hope of receiving grace. So at that last moment, Jonah prays and he's rescued. This is pure, undeserved grace from God. We get to see the Lord's sovereign hand at work. We're told that the fish is appointed. God had arranged for that exact fish to swim to that exact point, for that exact moment to swallow Jonah whole. Not to mention God's miraculous preservation of Jonah in the fish. As always with God, it is his sovereign grace that goes first. Before the thought of the prayer was even on Jonah's mind, God was arranging for that fish to be there at that exact point. Have you experienced God's grace in your life? Now, I'm not talking about a miraculous deliverance at sea. Have you experienced God's grace in the far deeper rescue, the far more important rescue from sin and death and hell? We've just celebrated Christmas because Jesus is the greatest gift that God could ever give. The only son of God come into the world to save us. His perfect life given for ours on the cross. And as Jonah was three days in the fish, so Jesus was three days in the tomb. And then his mighty resurrection, his resurrection that guarantees ours if we've received him as saviour and Lord. And so if you've not experienced God's grace in Jesus, please come along to our, our 3 two, one course starting this week to find out more. Talk to a Christian um, that you know. Come talk to me or one of the team here. We'd be all too delighted to share more about God's grace in Jesus with you. And if you have already received God's grace, well then let's look to Jonah to see how to respond. It's really very, very simple. My second heading Praise God. Praise God. Jonah records his praise for us in the form of a psalm, like those we get in the book of Psalms. Now, I'm sure Jonah didn't have a kind of writing desk and a candle and a Hebrew Bible there inside the fish. I imagine what he did was he, he filled out the words of the prayer that he prayed in the fish later on in these words recorded for us. But let's just have a look again at verses 1 to 6. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Jonah here rehearses his predicament for us. He was dead, or at least as good as dead. You might not be familiar with that word, Sheol. It's a Hebrew word for, for the grave. For the place of the dead. And in an ancient Near Eastern thinking, it was like a shadowy fortress with big barred gates, a forever one way sign pointing to the entrance. And those gates were found right at the bottom of the sea. The Jewish people weren't seafarers. They, in fact, often feared the sea. They called the Mediterranean the Great Sea. And it was a place of chaos. And it was a place where evil was constantly trying to overwhelm and reclaim the rest of creation. And so you can imagine Jonah's terror as he sinks down beneath the waves. He feels the increase in pressure and his kind of ears pop and it gets darker and darker as more and more water is above him beginning to block out the light. He's wrapped up in seaweed. He feels like a, a prisoner. And in his mind, he's down there at the roots of the mountains as he sinks down towards the bottom of the sea. He sunk as, as low as he can possibly go. His rebellion, his rejection of, of obedience to God has brought him to the gates of death. If you hear in chapter one, you might remember that when Jonah heard God's voice, he went down away from God to Joppa. He went down into the ship that was heading to Tarshish. And now he sinks down to the very gates of the grave. But Jonah prayed and Jonah was heard. 
Can you believe that this stubbornly rebellious prophet was heard? This is God's grace. Let's see what else Jonah says, continuing in verse 6. Yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. God did the impossible. He rescued Jonah from death and it's like he's been given new life. Praise the God of grace who saves, sings Jonah. Not the idols of the nations, not human strength or money or cleverness. Salvation belongs to the Lord. God's dramatic rescue of Jonah reminds me a little bit of um, that rescue of those Chilean miners in 2010. Do you remember the story? There was those 33 men and the, the poorly maintained tunnels collapsed. They were in a gold copper mine and hundreds and hundreds of metres below the surface. Hundreds of metres of rock between them and safety and freedom. There was no way out. There was no way of self-rescue. Only through outside help was there going to be any way back to the surface and to life? And in front of all of the kind of television cameras, wonderfully on screens around the globe, after 69 days, all 33 were rescued. The fish is God's outside help for Jonah. And in a far greater and more wonderful way, Jesus is God's outside help for us. If you were a Christian, then you were dead in your sins under the judgment of God, beyond all self-help. But God has graciously rescued you and given you life in Christ. And so will you praise God like Jonah? Salvation comes from the Lord. God's gracious rescue, it must lead us to praise. And so let's think, how, how much is, is praising God part of the rhythm of your life? It happens in all sorts of different ways, doesn't it? You know, on, on your knees, out loud, walking along, praying and praising God in your head, written down, in song, spontaneous, planned, at the start of the day, at the end of the day, throughout the day, alone, with others, praising God to others. We're all wired very differently, aren't we? And, and there'll be variation between each of us. But how much is of praising God? And particularly for his grace and his salvation, his rescue in Jesus. How much is that kind of praising God a thread that weaves its way through your life? Maybe that's something you'd like to think about working on in 2022. Jonah experiences God's grace. He's rescued. And his response is to praise God in this wonderful prayer. But there are hints in the chapter that not everything is right. Not everything is as it seems. And I think as readers, we're pushed to look for what's missing. So my final heading. Realise praise alone is not enough. Here are a few hints that I spotted in the chapter. First of all, the eloquence of Jonah's prayer itself kind of jars with us. As I said, his, his words have almost certainly kind of been polished and then given to us after the event. But just imagine Jonah trying to pray this, this wonderfully pious and eloquent prayer in the belly of a fish. You know, he's in pitch blackness, he's being tossed about to and fro, he's getting hit by bits of things from within the kind of fish's stomach. And he's praying this kind of almost perfect psalm-like prayer. It would make kind of good pantomime, I think. The situation that Jonah's in and the beauty of his prayer jar. Secondly, there's the line near the end of Jonah's prayer where he talks about idolaters forsaking any hope of God's love. Well, that jars because Jonah's the disobedient one. Jonah's the one who's ran. Jonah's the one who said no to God. Jonah's the one who's endangered others and even chosen death. But the pagan sailors on the boat, well, now they're former idolaters. At the end of chapter one, we saw how those on the boat praised God, made sacrifices to him, vowed to follow him. They became followers of the Lord. They received his steadfast love. So that jars. And then thirdly, how is it that Jonah's returned to the land of the living? 
We'll have a look again at verse 10. The Lord spoke to the fish and it carefully delivered Jonah onto dry land? No. It vomited him up. And Jonah lands on the beach. He's covered again in the contents of the fish's stomach. That was his company for the past three days. Now, unsurprisingly, in the Bible, vomit only ever has negative connotations. And so I think maybe, again, just maybe, this might be a hint of God's ongoing displeasure at Jonah. So these hints, not everything's quite right. And I think we're pushed to realise that Jonah's praise is not a sufficient response to God's. Praise alone is not enough. You see, when God's grace is truly received, it changes people. Has that been your experience? The Bible is full of wonderful examples. Take Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He's grabbing and greedy and, you know, takes from the poor to enrich himself. But then he meets Jesus. He becomes friends with Jesus. He begins to follow Jesus and he's transformed. The greed and the grabbing are gone and now he's generous, lavishly generous to those whom in the past he ripped off. God's grace changes lives. Salvation, you see, is not simply a ticket to heaven. It's not like getting on the tram. You know, you buy your ticket, you can do it on the app these days, you buy your ticket and then you sit on the tram, just wait to get to your destination, your Fleetwood or wherever else you're going. I think that's probably the only time that Fleetwood's been used as a proxy for heaven. Salvation is not just a ticket to heaven. Salvation is the start of a new relationship with God, receiving his love, walking in joyful obedience with him. Praise is an essential part of the Christian life. But praise alone is to miss the point. And so if we look really carefully back over Jonah's wonderful prayer, there's no confession. There's no repentance. There's no asking for forgiveness. What do we do every time we gather together as a church family like this? Well, one of the things we do is confess our sins. Is that because we're morbid and introspective people? No. It's because in Jesus there is forgiveness. There is freedom. Because every time we gather, we need our consciences cleansing and our joy restored in the Lord. Now, Elton John, by his musical works, is a pretty poor theologian, okay, granted. But there is one point at which I think he gets totally right. So kind of go on me with this, you know, suspend, suspend disbelief. Imagine he's just given a theology lecture and he's been asked some questions at the end of the lecture, okay? Dr. Elton. How would you, based on your experience, how would you describe the human condition? It's sad, so sad, it's a sad, sad situation. Dr. Elton, given that uh, God freely offers us his grace in Jesus, why don't you think more people come to him? Because sorry seems to be, sorry seems to be the hardest word. He's right, isn't he? There is no sorry in Jonah's prayer. There's no recognition of how he ended up in the mess that he got himself into in the first place. Jonah simply prays with confidence. God hears him and he's saved. Well, we too can be full of praise for God and yet far, far away from saying sorry. Well, that's a dangerous place to be because praise alone is not enough. God's grace works repentance in people's hearts and lives. So what do you like at saying sorry? We all know how failing to say sorry and a, a lack of forgiveness is really toxic to our relationships. We know that on a human level. I hate it when Katrina and I get into a fight at home and then there's that, that point that I feel the kind of spirit convicting me that I really need to say sorry. I need to step across the room and say sorry, but I resist. I really struggle to. Sorry really can be the hardest words. Well, the same is true in our relationship with God. If you're someone who's not yet a Christian, I think this is the biggest barrier that there is to overcome. Now, to become a Christian, and in fact, as we go on as Christians, we need to swallow our pride. We need to be able to admit that I deserve nothing but God's judgment. I'm just like a Jonah, I'm going my own way. I'm not going God's way, and I need rescue. I need changing. And so to follow Jesus, the first step is to say sorry to God and to mean it. 
Sorry can be the hardest words. But it is also the sweetest words. Because God in his grace promises full forgiveness in Jesus through his death and his resurrection for us. Sorry means relationship restored and renewed and enjoyed. And so if you're a Christian, how often do you confess and turn back to God? Every day we fall short. Every day I mess up again and again and again. Every day we need more grace. Don't let things build up on your conscience. Keep a short account with God. Don't be a Jonah. Confess to God and find renewed forgiveness and freedom. The book of Jonah so wonderfully, as we're going to see in later weeks again and again, so wonderfully demonstrates the grace of God for us. God is not done yet with Jonah. And God is not done yet with me or with you. Experience God's grace in Jesus. Praise him for his wonderful rescue. And this week, let's walk in lives of repentance. Walking in the freedom and the joy of relationship with God. Let me lead us in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so, so much for your grace. We thank you for how wonderfully generous and gracious you are to undeserving people like Jonah, undeserving people like us. Please, Father, would you move us in our hearts by your spirit that we would indeed live lives full of repentance, of glad and joyful repentance, saying sorry as we go our own way, turning back to your way again and again, and that we would know the wonder of a joyful, free relationship with you. And we ask this for his namesake. Amen.